Daniel Mati, welcome and thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah, I think it's fine. I'm going to talk about DevDroid. I suppose some of you already know what that is. Uh, in case you don't, uh, it's you know what Android is, right? Most of you have, have heard about it. I think so. Hope so. Um, so this talk we talk, we'll, we'll talk about F-Droid. And if you have any questions, uh, there will be some time in the end uh, for you to ask them. But during the talk, if you have any specific questions about what I'm talking about, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I believe there will be someone with a microphone who will bring it to you. And you can just shout your questions at me or throw me any rocks or anything you want to do. Um, and these are the... well. We are usually on IRC. I'm right now on IRC, but of course I won't be able to answer your questions. Uh, but if you ever have any doubts, uh, doubts or want to uh, tell us anything, we are we have an IRC channel on, free, on Freenode. Uh, there, there's our Gitorious repository or project, and my contact details. So let's begin. Uh, this is 2010, 2009 to be more precise, and Android was beginning to. Uh, gained strength, more people were beginning to buy phones with Android, and uh, Android, the AOSP, the Android, Android Open Source Project, itself is, is free software, it's under the Apache version 2 license, but when you, bu when you buy a phone, it comes with the Google apps, what it's called, the uh, G apps, and what that is basically is just uh, the non-free applications to, to connect to your Google account, and use the, what was then called, um, Android market, what's now known as uh, the Google Play. It's basically a means to get applications. Uh, it's always been closed, both in the server side, of course because it's run by Google, but also the client, and that has many disadvantages if you know what free software is. Uh, there were some alternatives, for example, um, Aptoid. Uh, I suppose most of you have heard of it, or other alternatives mar markets, for example, uh, Black Market. Uh, basically, what they do is they don't re require any registra uh, any username or account, and you can download anything you want at any time. You can upload your APKs, but it has a serious problem, and that is that um, applications are submitted as binary packages, as APKs. So there is no real way to know, even if you say, okay, I'm just going to download, download free software, do you really know if that is free software? Because if you are running, for example, Debian or Ubuntu or any other distribution, you don't download uh, binaries from the internet from random people. You go to your uh, distribution's repository and you download, download the packages that were signed by a maintainer and you know, yeah, that is uh, exactly what I want that corresponds to the source code that um, the upstream published and you have a way to make sure that that's the case. So in 2010, uh, this is what you had if you had Android. There was no real way to run Android freely. And then in mid-2010 in mid came a, a really great and underrated project called uh, Replicant. Basically what they were trying to do is uh, make a free software version of Android. They started by stripping off all the non-free parts, including the Google parts. And uh, of course, there were still problems with the drivers because uh, most, if not all, uh, Android phones have non-free 3D drivers. But uh, one of the key parts of a system is how you get applications. So one of their first tasks was to get an alternative to one of these two because of the reasons I just stated. So this is when in the Replicant project tried, I, think, I believe, twice uh, to make a replacement market. I believe they started one of these projects, uh, but it didn't really take off. And in uh, late 2010, there was uh, one man from England called uh, Kiaran. I actually don't know how to pronounce his surname. I, th I believe it's uh, Goldniex. Uh, that's his Gitorious account. And what he did was um, he had this idea of making uh, a free software re repository, a free software market for Android. This was actually the first logo that he made. It's, a, it's like a Stalmanish uh, Android. It's quite fun. So it was based on three principles. Uh, the, first one, the first one is obvious. It's um, the software that it's, is to be published in the main repository 
because we are talking about repositories, so even if the software that provides the service is free, you, ha you can have repositories which are non-free. But uh, we, he started uh, uh, the main repository, the one enabled by default, the only one recommended, and the only one assured to have only free software uh, applications and under a free software license. Um, there were two other requirements. Which may, might, which may not seem uh, so obvious at first sight, but for example, having the source code in a VCS, in a version control system, is a huge part, because for example, imagine that an application is uh, published as uh, tar.gz or tar.whatever, um, tarballs or sibs or whatever, in a website. Yeah, you can download version 1.0 and 1.0, and you can keep them, keep them and and you can uh, distribute them, but it's uh, it's hard to work with. Uh, it var it var it's it changes from application to application. It's hard to work with. It's a lot easier if upstream uses Git, uh, Mercurial, Subversion, or, an, or even horrible uh, VCS types <laughs> applications. And uh, last but not least, uh, the app must be buildable from from source only. And this might be might seem a bit off, but it's actually um, a thing that you encounter, that applications are free software, but they can only be built with non-free software. For example, um, an application might itself be free, but it might depend on the Google Play services. For example, it's a library that interacts with uh, the Google applications on your phone to, for example, check that you have uh, Google Maps or that you are, or that you can use your Google account to interact with Google in some way. I actually don't really know what it does, that's the point. <laughs> uh, there's one really important thing that I want to highlight here, and that's it's the usage of tags. If you have ever used Git, Mercurial, uh, Subversion, any of these version control systems, you know that the three principles, well, actually the two, are branches and tags. Branches are uh, useful to have, but uh, if you are to package an application, the most important part is attack. Attack is a way of saying this is released, for example, 1.6. Because if you just have a list of changes, uh, sometimes it's really hard to know what change made the release. For example, some people will just say some changes, some more stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then you go and say, OK, the version was bumped, was changed in this release. But then the actual release on Google Play was made two months later. So what is going on here? What am I to build? So if upstream tags one of these commits, one of these uh, releases, one of these changes as the actual release with a, with a name that actually corresponds to the version name, it's a lot easier. And this, is, and this is just reminding people what actually source code means. Because uh, you find lots of applications that say, yeah, we are a free software. Uh, our source code is published somewhere, like on GitHub, for example. And then you go to, to the repository and you find, uh, oh, there's a, there are three JAR packages in there, which are basically compiled Java classes. And there are two native libraries already compiled for you. So yay, you can get to build the tiny Java part of the application, the tiny part that is the UI, but the rest of the application is completely closed. It might be open source, but the way it's published, you cannot build it from source. That's actually, that actually happens a lot more than you would think. Uh, so it was based on Git. It's the easiest way to, um, to encourage community participation. We had three parts. We still have three parts. The client, which was forked from Aptoid, because um, they already had a working uh, client for Android. It did the basics that we needed, that we needed. and it already uh, had a, a specification for an index in XML that contained the information, the information of the repository and of each application, as well as all the versions you could download. The server, which uh, was started and is still written in Python, uh, which basically just manages applications, builds them and publishes them, and the data, which is basically the recipes, the, uh, it contains information of each application, for example, the description and the web page, but it also contains how to build the application, because all the applications in FDroid, at least in the main repository, are built from source. 
There are actually two exceptions for now. Uh, there were more before because of legacy reasons, because when we started, uh, you can do everything at, at once. So first, there was the software and then the, the service in good quality. So now we are getting rid of, of all the non-built applications from source. Uh, and this is what it looked like. Uh, you had the, uh, the droid, the magnificent uh, icon. It used Aptoide. Uh, it, was, it was forked from Aptoide. Well, actually, it was more inspired uh, by Aptoide, by Aptoid, uh, because um, the source code of the application in Java was uh, taken as, as a start point, but it rapidly diverged because, for example, we want to support multiple repositories uh, and they can be at any place you want. Uh, for example, that's, that's one way you can, they, they, it differs from Aptoid. Uh, we used Python, we still use Python for the server side. Uh, we use virtual machines to assure that the applications are built in a clean environment, separated from any, uh, you could say, malicious uh, person or whatever. Um, it uses VirtualBox for that. Uh, we use OpenJDK to compile the Java classes, of course. And uh, as a start, we only supported Apache Ant, which was the um, default build environment for Android. Uh, when the first applications came out, and it was actually the recommended environment up until 2013 when Gradle came out. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so I would like to play a little game called Spot the, Dif the Difference. Uh, this was uh, the Aptoid client somewhere in 2010, and this was one of the first version of or one of the first versions of Aptoid. So you can see, uh, yeah, the font is a bit different. Instead of saying of date possible, it says two, version of, two versions available. Instead of ratings, it shows license, but it's basically the same thing, exactly the same thing. And um, if you notice, the client has changed a lot in the last years. It started as, a, as just a hack over the, the Android logo. But in 2012, uh, a guy called William Thicker uh, made a new, a brand new logo under CC, uh, CC, Creative Commons license. And in th 2013, about four months ago, another guy made an improvement. Well, just a change over it under the same license because it's, you can clearly see it's based on the same icon. But it's just to give some breath to, to the project, uh, give it a new look. And this is how it looks actually uh, right now. We changed from Ubuntu to Debian. Uh, we are no longer based on, on Aptoid because the, the project has d diverged too much. We still use OpenJDK and, and Apache Ant, but we now support many other build environments. If you are a Java developer, especially an Android developer, you will know that uh, there are other build environments you can use. The first one to appear in around 2010, 2012, uh, was Maven, which we uh, supported from 2011, but quite recently uh, appeared Gradle with a plugin for Android. And it's really great because it allows you to, for example, use dependencies without having to um, commit j uh, jar files, compiled Java classes to your VCS, which is common practice with Ant in the libs directory, which is a pain, to be honest. So uh, some challenges that um, Fast forward to 2013. Uh, this is when I joined the project about a year ago. And these were the biggest challenges, the biggest problems that the project faced. For example, client performance, it was barely usable in, in older phones, mainly because the repository had gotten really big. It started with uh, 50, 100 applications, and now it was sitting at about 500, and now it's at almost 1,000. So imagine if the client is supposed to read and parse and understand 50 applications, you don't really have to make it uh, efficient because you can just read, for example, read all the applications and save them in memory, which is what we do right now, which is, you could say it's, it's stupid, but it's simple. But yeah, once you get to a thousand applications, it's no longer possible. For example, my phone, which has nearly a gigabyte of memory, already has problems parsing them. So that's something we had to fix. Grail support, like we said, uh, client design, the, the design was quite old. Uh, more automation, this is essential in any um, app maintaining service. You want to make it as, as automatic as possible because uh, you don't want people to do uh, the same thing over and over again, uh, both because it's a waste of time, people will get tired, you will get less contributors, etc. Uh, User-friendly metadata. 
uh, like you said, we want people to be uh, comfortable adding applications and maintaining them in F-Droid. Uh, security, this is something that um, we had always in mind, but it's, it's always possible to improve. I mean, we always used SSL, but uh, people have brought ways to improve it. For example, using certificate pinning or using GPG on top of SSL, etc. Icon loading, this, was, uh, this is another kind of client performance issue, and it is that uh, we used to uh, load all the, all the icons at startup uh, when you first open the, the client. And again, this is fine if you have uh, a repository with 20 applications, but if you have 1,000 applications, it could very well take 10 minutes to download icons, so that's a big no-no. Uh, so we start with Gradle. Um, I did an internship last summer in, uh, in, in Berlin with the FSFE and I really had a lot of time to work on F-Droid and I met a really ni a nice guy called, I actually don't know his real name, uh, a shout out to people using uh, usernames in no way related to, the, to their actual name. So we'll just say that his name is Ligi or Ligi or whatever. And he already used Gradle for his, for his application and his application was already in F-Droid in the main repository, but it wasn't updated, so he said, hey, can you help me update the application since we are both here having a beer? Uh, and and uh, we spoke about Gradle, and he helped me at support for it. And it's now really a lot easier to package an application if it uses Gradle. Another improvement when we spoke about uh, icon loading was uh, there's a library called Universal Image Loader, and what it does is um, it's a very small library, and you use it to load applications um, in an asynchronous way. For example, you have a list view, uh, a list of applications you can uh, fling through, and inst instead of having, loading, uh, having loaded all the icons from the internet onto your SD card or your hard drive uh, before taking 10 minutes or more, uh, what it does is you just tell it, hey, I, I want this icon, and he will say, uh, have I got this icon already downloaded? If I have it, I will just display it. If not, I will download it. So it's, it's really easy to use and it makes uh, the first run of F-Droid uh, seamless because you, it takes about five seconds. And, well, you have to download the index, but once you've done that, uh, the icons are downloaded uh, as you need them. So this is how the client uh, looks now. If you remember about uh, seven slides before, I showed you what the client looked when we forked uh, Aptoid. Now Aptoid looks a lot differently. I personally don't like their user interface, mainly because they use their own theme. I like the fact that, I really like the fact that our application uses the Holo themes, which integrate with the, with the system. The, actually, it's the, the, it's the default theme. We didn't change a thing. Uh, so we added, for example, you can change from black to white uh, themes, and you can also, for example, suppose my device, uh, if you, with the 48 by 48 uh, DP pixels, mostly, um, icons. Uh, yeah, the, the icons are really big, but uh, I would, it, it would be better for me if I could see more applications at once. So by adding a, prefer a preference to make the icons smaller, I can see about three applications more per screen, but that's, I really like it. And then we come to the mighty Recipe. Uh, Recipe is what it's called, um, recipe, sorry. English. Um, that's what we call the, um, it's actually the part of the metadata that tells F-Droid how to build the application. It's mostly plain text, but you can introduce some shell scripting into it. So for example, let's look at, uh, this is how, um, this is the legacy way of writing a, recip a recip recipe for F-Droid. Um, you would say build version. Uh, 2.0 is the version name. If you are used to Android, you might know that um, in Android, uh, the, version, the, the versions aren't compared by the 2.0 vers versus 2.1 or whatever. Uh, you, you associate a number with the version and then you compare the numbers, which one is bigger. This is a bit weird. I, I don't really know what, why this is done, maybe for performance reasons. Uh, but you, you, you end up, for example, with an application having version 1.0 with ver code 10, version code 10, and then version 0 0.5 with version code 20, and then you update from 1.0 to 0 0.5, and you go, what is going on? Well, nobody knows. Um, upstream has gone crazy. No, I, I don't know. 
But this is what you do. You set 2.0 version code 2000, uh, 200, and tag uh, v2.0. This is what we said about tags. It's really easy to, to know which tag to build against if, you, if the upstream uses tags. So for example, if the, if the application is inside a subdirectory within the repository, you would say, my, sub my, my subdirectory is my app. And what if it uses uh, native code? Uh, native code is a way of running, for example, uh, C or C++ code on Android on a lower level for higher performance. So in here, just telling this application uses uh, native code, build it. So this is what uh, a normal re uh, recipe in, in F-Droid looked before we, well, the, leg the legacy way of doing it. And this is a rather easy and simple um, recipe. So for example, this is building version 2.0. It has native, co native code. If you are used to Apache Ant and, on Android, you will know that you have to update a project before building it. So you had to tell F-Droid update the current project. And for example, if it's using some library in that path, update that path as well. Uh, if it's also using another library, but is, it is not part of the source code, we added uh, source libs, which are basically that. So uh, it's using some Android lib at version 1.0. Uh, you, you, may, you may have to remove APKs from, from the repository, which is actually pretty crazy. I mean, who would add an, an APK to Git? I don't know. If anyone has an answer for that, please raise your hand. No, right. <laughs> And pre-build is just adding the library to the project that properties. If you are used to Ant, you know what this is. If you don't, it's, it's just a way of telling uh, Apache Ant, build this application which depends on that library at that path. And this is the new uh, format of the builds. You see that we stripped version, it's just built now. And it uses uh, one uh, field per line um, style. It's, it's either tabbed or spaced. Uh, he doesn't mind tabs or spaces. And it's a lot nicer to read uh, recipes this way. But what's more, I remember before when we said uh, that at automation is a huge part of F-Droid. Well, we tried it to be, we want it to be a huge part. So uh, one of the things uh, we did was make mo the usual things automatic. For example, uh, source lips. Um, if you say one, one uh, and two points on the library, what it will do is automatically do, you see the echo command, it will do the same, but in Python. So that's gone. Uh, updating libraries, it will read project.properties, and it will uh, get all the paths and update them automatically. So that's another thing automated. And finally, well, these are just some, ex some examples, lots more were automated. And um, the, for example, the APK is directory, Again, if, if an upstream is uh, weird enough to upload an APK to Git or Mercurial or whatever, uh, FDroid will uh, read through the whole, um, will read all the files on the repository and will say, hey, this application is an APK, so I'm just going to remove it because in no way it can be used to build an application from source. And uh, after, we sp uh, after I told you about how we made it easier for people to add and maintain applications on F-Droid, these are just some charts to show you that I think it worked because uh, these things were added uh, more or less between 2012 and 2013. And you can see that ever since there have been some bumps in the, uh, around Christmas because uh, geeks have free time and it's snowy, so... But uh, you can see that it's kind of gotten getting bigger in the number of co commits per month. We actually hit a thousand commits in January. It's a new record. And uh, contributors, we've never had so many people contribute via merge requests on on Gitorius, which are the kind of the the pull request for GitHub. You have the the, the merge request for Gitorius. It's more or less the same. Uh, like we said, uh, some things were were automated. So we started to automatically update applications. So you say, this application uses tags. It, it for example, uses Gradle or uses Ant, but in a sensible way. Uh, it, we trust the upstream. It, uh, he or she only uses uh, free software. So we'll have this application 
automatically updated by F-Droid. So the moment that uh, Upstream tags a new release, within a day, the update will be in F-Droid without anyone touching anything. Of course, it will be checked, but most of the time, well, actually, we've never had any problems with the 70 application that we currently automatically update. Because uh, we have, like we said, we have these checks that actually make sure that there are no, no binary, no per build parts in the source code. Well, I actually already spoke about that. That's organization for you. Anti-features. Um, this is a really nice thing to have. For example, if, if an application is fully free software, but it uses uh, a Google service, but without using any non-free library, would you say that the application is free or non-free? Well, some people would say, yeah, the application is fully free software, so it can be in F-Droid. But some other people will say, uh, no, it can't be. It, it's kind of like the Debian uh, Contrib repository. It's free software, but it depends in some way on non-free software, even if it's not part of the device. So we added these anti-features because we believe they are parts of the code, uh, functionalities that are actually worse than uh, we would be better off without them. But we still package the application either with them or without them. But either way, they are marked as, hey, this application has this anti-feature. Uh, beware, this is a warning. Some of these uh, anti-features might be tracking. For example, an application might be fully free software, but it might uh, ping the upstream server, the developer server, to check for updates. Of course, we don't want an application to update itself. That, that's crazy. If you had uh, Debian or Ubuntu and applications updated themselves, it would be a, a chaos. I mean, you have APT, Aptitude, uh, whatever, and you update all the applications through there. And in Android, it should be the same. But some, some developers just say, no, I'm not going to trust Google Play. I'm not going to trust F-Droid. I will have my applications updated via my own way. Etc. Uh, packet signing. Uh, if you are a, an Android user or developer, you might know that in Android, an APK, which is basically a, a zip archive, archive, um, they are signed via. Well, it, it's a jar. It's signed uh, like with the command jar signer, and uh, you have your um, secret keys, and then you sign your APKs. For example, if you are a, a developer and you want to upload an application to the Google Play. You make the application, you compile it, you sign it with your key, and then you upload it to Google Play. And the thing is that Android won't let you update the application unless the, uh, op op the APK you are updating to, the new version, is signed by exactly the same key. So if a developer loses his key, basically, uh, he, all the users are already using the, that app to, in a, uh, in order to update it, we'll have to uninstall it, maybe save their data in some way, like with a backup, and then reinstall it again. It's a bit messy. I suppose it's done uh, for security reasons, but it, it, it brings uh, a problem to F-Droid, and that is that uh, we can't really rely on upstream developers to sign the, the applications for us, because suppose that uh, you want to make a repository for yourself. Uh, you can't expect a developer to be, sign, to be signing the APKs for maybe hundreds of repositories out there that publish your application. It's crazy. What we do is um, every repository has their, their, their own keychain, their, their own set of keys, and uh, with a hash made out of the, the package ID, the unique identifier of the application, you sign every application with a different key. And um, this is done for various reasons, um, mainly because applications, if they share the same signature, they, they can interact with each other. And as a general rule, you don't want to do that. In some cases you want, but then you can change it. But as a general rule, each application his own signature, and that signature comes from the repository. And this is a really, if you don't know the, if you don't know the Guardian project, it's a really great project. Uh, what they do is they have some uh, really important applications, for example, the Tor application or the Chat Secure application. Uh, you might have heard them, of them. Uh, they fo focus on privacy and security, on Android especially. And they have uh, contributed to F-Droid because they want to use F-Droid as a means to update their applications and keep uh, an Android environment secure. 
And for example, uh, Hans, I believe he's called Hans. Again, usernames in no way related to actual names. Thank you. <laughs> um, they, they are developing a GPG port to Android, fully supporting GPG. I mean, it's actually the same code that runs on Linux. It's running in Android. And they are uh, currently adding that to F-Droid. And there was another uh, guy called uh, Daniel, I believe, who added two important features to the way we do SSL. One of them is um, TOFU, Trust on First Use. And it's basically if you use your own certificate, uh, but, the, uh, but the system doesn't trust it, you can trust it yourself once, and then it remembers that choice. And Android pinning, uh, it's actually, I'm not really good at um, and an, an encryption because I haven't done it uh, at university yet. But for those of you who know what certificate pinning is, it's a way of avoiding CAs, of avoiding certificate authorities. You can have your own certificate and make your, your application, your repository work in a secure way without, well, with you yourself signing the, the, the certificate without any organization having to sign it for you. Uh, this is a really... Whoop. What happened there? Can't I go back? Seems like I can't. Well, anyway, uh, you, did you see the super F-Droid, the F-Droid with the Superman thing on top? Uh, it's, it's a, well, I like to call it super F-Droid because um, it's, it's a way of making F-Droid a system application and then it would be able to do things like the Google Play does. For example, installing and uninstalling applications with, without you having to go through the dialogue saying OK, accept, etc., uh, etc. Et and you might think, well, I don't want an application to automatically install uh, other applications. But if the application is free software and the application uh, only does that if you want, it's a great idea because uh, you can control what it does. And then we move on. Well, we actually are here already. Uh, we move on to uh, the frequently asked questions. Before you ask any questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, why isn't my app in F-Droid? This is a common one. Uh, for various reasons, it could be. Uh, the main one, uh, the easiest one, is because no one has had time to do it, because you haven't asked for it. But uh, the more, um, one thing that has happened more and more as the project grows is that people think that free software is free as in beer. So they say, hey, my application is free. Why are, is it not an F-Droid? And I'm angry, and I will shout at you through the forums and insult you. <laughs> and uh, the second one, uh, why is application X not yet updated on F-Droid? Well, for the same reasons. New, newer versions might not be free. In that case, we would notify you or maybe remove the application from the repository. Uh, this is a great one. Why don't, uh, well, we keep stats of downloads of APKs via the web, via the HTTP server. So people often ask, why don't you just um, uh, make it possible to sort the list of applications by number of downloads? And it makes sense in some way because uh, you would be able to find the applications that most people find interesting. But in a way, it's both useless in a way because someone can just download an application 100 times and that doesn't make it any more interesting. If you are the developer, you can make a, a cron job to download it a thousand, time per hour, a thousand times per hour, and within a day, it would, it would be the number one application on a repository. It's stupid. And um, rating systems. If you attended the game development, game development talk yesterday, it's the same issues that they had. How do you make a rating system that's, um, that, that's an anonymous, that, um, is, that works in the sense that people can't vote a thousand times? And that's actually, that makes sense. Uh, we actually have no way to do that, so we haven't done it yet. Because, for example, we don't want people to have to register to use F-Droid, which kind of would be necessary to make unique uh, votes. But then you go into the trouble of, what if a, a user makes five accounts and votes five times? It's, it's difficult. So, so for now, we're just not, not doing it at all. You don't support my build system. Uh, well, if you use a weird build system, we would like to support it, but we don't have time. So you are free to set up your own F-Droid repository and fight with it. And well, that's it. I mean, uh, that's often the answer. Uh, application X something is not yet an F-Droid, but I know it's free, so I'm going to download it from someplace else. 
Sometimes that's true. I mean, if we haven't had time or nobody has tried to add the application, it might be free, but it's not yet in the main repository. But uh, I wanted to talk about Telegram. Um, maybe some of you have heard of that application. Um, it's supposed to be free software, and I believe it is free software, but since the source code contains uh, both uh, compiled Java classes in a, in a jar, which I suppose they are free software, but not, I could check, but I haven't done yet. And, but the most important part is that they contain a native library, which I believe does the encryption part. It's called uh, libmessages.so. So no, uh, as it is now, it's, it's not possible, or at least it's not easy to build it from source. So uh, there are actually lots of people asking both to Upstream and to us, why isn't this app on f -Droid? Well, you can just go and uh, bother Upstream until they make it possible to build it entirely from source. Uh, this is the forums, the submission queue. You can uh, say, hey, I would like this application on F-Droid, but uh, we are lazy and we don't go through the forums that often. And there are like 500 applications waiting in the queue, so they are not going to be done by themselves. So the, the, easier, the easier way to do it is to just do a merge request. Uh, you yourself having added the application already, having filled all the data, having made it possible to build it from, uh, from source, so we just most of these are merged quite rapidly in, the, in less than a day. And this is um, to show some, some statistics. Uh, one of these two is F-Droid with a dash, the other one is F-Droid without a dash on, on Google, Google Trends. This is the number of Google searches for F-Droid. So you can see that uh, it increased uh, steadily from 2011. And then in, to, in early 2013, it started to boom. Now, you, you may think that's because uh, we started to work really hard on it, or because we were doing really great, or because, uh, I don't know, any good reason that could be, um, well, any good reason. But if you see this graph, you can see some, a little bit of relation between the lines. The orange line and is the number of searches for Adaway. Do you know the application? Adaway. Uh, it's an application that uses the host file on Linux, on Android actually, uh, to block advertisements. It was a really popular app on Google Play. It had over 5 million downloads, a lot of downloads. And it suddenly, the policy suddenly changed and they said, your application cannot interfere with other applications in any way whatsoever. So in the matter of hours, Adaway was completely gone from Google Play and there was no other way to download it except from upstream. And then Upstream said, uh, well, thank you very much, but instead of pub publishing APKs directly, which he also provides as an alternative, uh, he started to say to tell people, just, go, just download F-Droid and keep my app updated uh, via F-Droid. So there were suddenly, I don't want to say millions, but tens of thousands of people Googling F-Droid, add away, and then you see the peak in F-Droid uh, searches and downloads. There, so no, it wasn't actually us. That's a bit depressing, but anyway, uh, the project is getting bigger, which is good. Uh, and this is uh, as a um, as a conclusion. Where are we on February second, two thousand fourteen? We have nine hundred and ninety apps, which is impressive, uh, taking into account that they are all built from source. And uh, this compares to, for example, Aptoid, uh, who have, I believe, uh, more than a hundred thousand applications. But as I said, they are all just uploaded APKs, so it doesn't really account, it doesn't really compare. Uh, we had uh, more than a thousand commits in January, which is a new record, which shows again that the project is growing and more people are, are contributing. Uh, this is a bit uh, unsettling. Uh, I say up to uh, 13 million APK downloads, because these, these are just from the logs in, in our web server. And when you count the number of downloads of the APKs you host, they might be, for example, Google bots uh, searching in a page for information. It might be somebody downloading an application 10 times. It might be somebody do installing version 1.0 and then updating to 1.1, which accounts as two downloads, etc. So it's 13.6 million, but the actual number of installs could be really a, a tenth of that. But what is a more uh, sensible way of, measure, of measuring how big the user base is, is by looking at the number of downloads for the official client releases on the repository. 
If you look at 0 0.55, it, uh, it was released on November and it was downloaded, downloaded uh, more than 60,000 uh, 60, times. And 0 0.58, uh, which is about, from about three weeks ago, three weeks ago it was downloaded uh, nearly 4,000 times, 40,000 times. So if you make a bit of uh, assumptions here, you can take out, okay, so you, uh, from the 0 0.55 uh, numbers, you can say that we have up to 50,000, 60,000 uh, users, but uh, how many of these actually updated to 0 0.58? Uh, not nearly 40,000, but then you also think, but maybe some people are still running an old version and don't know it. So more or less, uh, as, a, as an approximation, you, can, you could say that we have 30, 40,000 uh, users, which is quite impressive. So this is the end of the speaking part. Now comes the, the questions part. Uh, feel free to ask anything at all. You can see now the Super F Droid logo, which went away before. And again, if you have any questions, you can ju just drop by IRC or the forums or any way you want. To. Um, you, you talked about multiple repositories. A, a bit louder, please. Yeah, uh, you talked about multiple repositories. <coughs> and um, last time I checked, which was some time ago, but I did not find any documentation about how to set up your own F-Droid uh, repository. Is there any? And uh, do you know of any repositories apart from the official one? Uh, sorry, are you asking how to how do we sign the applications or how to make? Uh, <coughs> what was your question? Uh, oh, uh, is there any documentation about how to host an FDroid repository? A binary repository or just a source build repository? A binary repository with APKs that you just upload or a source repository like ours built entirely from source? Um, a, a repository that I can add in my FDroid client and download the app from. I can't understand you, sorry. <laughs> a binary. A, a repository that you can also have the F-Droid client download from. Oh, right. Uh, there's a, a screen in the F-Droid client where you can select which repositories to use. And we actually added uh, link schemes that you can use on your website as, a, for example, a QR code. And then with the client, you can just uh, scan it uh, with a third-party app, and then after you will open it, add the repository, download the index, and then you're set to go. And there are actually other existing repositories apart from the official one? Uh, there's uh, one by the Guardian project, because uh, formerly we didn't have all their applications, but now we are adding them. Uh, we are working with them on adding them built from source. So for now, no, there is no other um, Big repository, you know what I mean. There are smaller ones, but nothing to to use as a general rule. Um, do you plan to add a, a dependency system uh, for for the builds? For instance, uh, there is a game and it requires SDL. So currently, every game has to uh, rebuild SDL each time. Is there a plan to to do a dependency system like in Debian? Uh, you mean the dependencies at build time or at runtime? At, uh, well, maybe both, or at, at least at build time. At build time, we use a, a virtual machine and we have uh, Ruby scripts, Chef scripts, uh, which uh, we use to install the packages ne uh, necessary to build all the applications which are right now in the re repository. So that's set. I mean, uh, if you just use the, the script we use to set up the machine, you will get exactly the same setup and you can build exactly the same applications. And on the Android side, uh, we don't have a dependency system yet. We are thinking about it. And that's because uh, Android doesn't do dependencies like uh, most Linux systems do. I mean, if you, for example, if you use, uh, when we talked about, uh, about the icon loading before, we use a third-party library called uh, Universal Image Loader. That application is what you could say statically linked. You build it, and it gets included into your APK. So you don't have to have it installed on the, on the device because it comes with the application. On the other hand, you can have applications uh, work as libraries or as plugins to other applications. So yeah, we want to add support for dependencies. Okay, but uh, for dependencies that are uh, in the build system uh, that could be reused for several applications, uh, is there something planned? 
Uh, well, you just add it to the uh, generic uh, build environment. It's the same build environment for every application. So if you add, for example, uh, some PNG library to build one application, it will be uh, available for all the applications if they want to use them, if they want to use that library at build time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, oh. um, you talk about uh, Maven and Gradle. Yeah. Uh, so these two tools uh, use uh, use Maven repositories to yeah. grab the libraries for your application. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, uh, do you uh, do you use pre-built Maven uh, libraries or do you uh, build back the libraries or hmm. something, or do you trust? Uh, I don't know, or check license on this kind of thing about dependencies uh, coming from that. Hmm. Um, when we started adding um, Gradle support, Maven was already supported and we were already using the Maven Central repository. And since the Maven Central repository is, uh, you could say it's trusted, uh, you can trust on it entirely, but uh, we do trust it on it for now. Uh, one of the, well, for both Maven and Gradle, of course we don't trust th third parties, uh, third party repositories by default, you have to look into them. Um, but uh, w you are right, what we want to do is make our own Maven repository with all the instructions to build all the libraries from source. But that's a big, really big project, it needs a lot of work. And uh, nobody has uh, shown up to it yet, so for now we are just sticking to the easy way. Yeah, so maybe you mentioned it, but I missed it. Um, as far as I can tell, after it is not on the Play Store, um, did you try to get it in? Are you boycotting the Play Store, Google Play Store, or did Google say we will not let you in because you're a competitor? Well, can you comment on that? Uh, you mean having F-Droid on the Google Play? Right, right. Uh, well, that's actually easy to answer. We just can't have it on Google Play. Because okay, so it's Google not letting you in. Uh, right. Uh, well, even before, when it, I don't know if it was ever possible, we never wanted it to have on. We, we never wanted to have it on Google Play because it's a bit of uh, counterintuitive, because it's doing the opposite of, of Google Play. But uh, the easy answer is you just can't because one of the one of the rules of Google Play is that an application in Google Play cannot do the same that Google Play does, which is install and update applications. Any more questions? No? Well, thank you very much. I have, I have no. one question. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, is it possible to build uh, apps that are using Qt and QML? Uh, go again. Is it possible? So you can build native Android apps written in Java, but can you also build Qt apps? Qt. Um, I actually looked into this uh, last summer. At the time, it was really hard to to build Qt applications from from Qt source. I mean, from uh, C plus plus. I, I believe it's gotten easier now, but uh, I don't think we have any Qt app as of yet. Um, mainly because I haven't looked into it, but uh, I think it's doable. Okay, thank you. Thank Any you very more? much. Thank you.